It's called the Mishkan. It's the tent of meaning. It's the place of glory. Mishkan. Shekan is where we get the word Shekinah from. So this is the place of the glory. Everybody say the place of the glory. And last week we set up all of the different boards side by side. Wes, come up here real quick. Bob, get up here again. Wayne, come up here real quick. And I'll show you how this was last week. 48 boards, 20 on each side. And these are in set position. Amen. One board was placed 10 cubits high, cubit and a half wide. Another one set right beside it. And then till there's 20 boards. And this is a picture of the unity of the saints. In the outer court, you have posts that hold up the exterior of the fence. And all of us need to be like a post. We need to get grounded and get planted in the things of God. Well, you as laity, everybody say laity, or just people that love the Lord, are posts. And we need you to be able to build this house. But then there's eldership. And the eldership, oh God, people that are mature and people that are strong in the Lord, amen, that stand full stature, that stand side by side just like these, 20 on one side, 20 on the other, 8 in the back. And that makes 48 boards. It's very interesting that there were 48 priestly cities in Israel. And so Bethlehem was a priestly city. That's why the Lamb of God was born in the priestly city of Bethlehem. Bethlehem, the house of, of bread. And so this is talking about priesthood. Just as in the outer court, the posts, amen, speak of our steadfastness and our stability in Christ. Now we come to eldership. We're to grow up into Him, right? Because the outer court posts are five cubits high, but these are ten cubits high. And I want you to know you're not there yet. You need to increase stature. You need to get higher and higher in the things of the Spirit of God. Because this building is going to be what? It's what's going to house the Shekinah or house the glory. We have had visitations. Everybody say visitation. But he said that this is a habitation of God through His Spirit. It's God didn't just want to make visits and drop in from Sunday to Sunday. He wants a habitation in His people where He dwells amongst us and never has to ever leave us again. Come on, folks. Because this tabernacle is about to move to a, a heavenly tabernacle and the glory of the Lord is going to be with us forever and ever. In the outer court, there are feelings. Everybody say feelings. I've got goosebumps and doodads, a whoopee, that's great. If you're the lamb tethered to the horns of the altar, you're going to be kicking and jumping and all kinds of gyrations. But there's more to it than just feelings. You come into the inner court and there is presence. Everybody say his presence. Oh, I love the presence of the Lord. In the presence of the Lord, there's healing. But there's a third court. And that's not feelings, that's the body. That's not presence, that's the mind. But this one is what glory and that's the spirit and I am not satisfied with just some goosebumps in the outer court or just feeling his presence in the inner court I want to move through the veil to where the heavy weighty glory presence of God pushes me down to the floor where he becomes Lord of everything so thank you guys that's a picture of what God wants us to frame ourselves as a as, as a building of God, as a body of God. And we shared last week, as everybody's standing up in a big circle, that the safest place in Christian County, Green County, Taney County, Stone County, the safest place you can be is right here. Amen. We talk about a safe place. This is it. And then a happy place. At our, at our house, we got pillows that Tricia has that says, this is our happy place. Amen. So everybody say safe place, happy place. Amen. Glory place. Lift your hands and ask Him to fill us with His glory this morning. Lord, we pray for a few minutes that the spirit of revelation will begin to just show us things in God that we have never seen before. I need, Lord, a mantle of power to be able to share this morning's message because, Lord, there are depths and there are facets of God's glory that we'll miss if you don't give us ears to hear. And we ask your, this favor in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. So we're going to look at four things this morning. They are what? They are curtains, covers, cords, and colors. Let me say that again. Curtains and covers, cords and colors. The curtains are two. There are white linen that goes over the top of this particular uh, architecture. And that white linen is, comes from Egypt. It's twisted. It's bleached. We'll talk about it in a minute. Over the top of that is black goat's hair. 
Amen. It is a symbol of Christ our sin bearer. White, he's Christ our righteousness. Black, he's Christ our sin bearer. He took our darkness. He took our sin. Over the top of that is going to be ram skins that have been dyed red. So that when God looks down at the Mishkan, he doesn't see the black of our past. He sees the red blood of his son. Over the top of that, there's going to be a fourth covering. Amen. The curtains are white linen and black goat's hair. The coverings are red ram skins and a outer covering that is called badger skins. We'll look at different things that that might be in a minute. Then there will be cords that are propped over the top, staked into the ground. Amen. How many know he drew us with cords of love in Hosea 11 and verse 4? He's loved us with an everlasting love. These cords are what? They're staked into the ground. Stake is halfway in the ground, invisible. Halfway above the ground, visible. How many know, folks, that our relationship, Jesus was buried, but Jesus also lives. And I am corded to God by his love, banded to him. Amen. And cords and then colors. And we'll look at these different colors of white and of black and of scarlet and of a grayish color that we'll look at in just a minute. I think I want to get this out of my way for just a second so we can see better. Uh, somebody over there, Mark, you available, or Jim or somebody, grab this uh, little table over here and bring it and its contents right up here. And I'm going to try to illustrate to you what we're looking at. Next slide. Or Jim's already gone, so he can't get the next slide. Hand that to me and you can get the next slide. Praise the Lord. This is our communion table, but it's going to have to serve as the uh, tent of meeting this morning. And there are going to be four things that are draped around this. and We'll move through these and this will give you a real simple understanding of the gospel. Amen. These four, two curtains, two covers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is going to be easy for you to see this. In 1 Corinthians 1 and 30, it talks about these four. For of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, there's the white, and righteousness, there's the black that he became sin for us, sanctification, there's the red blood that covers it, and redemption, here is the entire covering of the plan of God over your life. So look at these. The first one, and uh, this will play this little uh, video that we've been looking at each, each week. And... Uh, There'll be, there'll be the first covering of linen, and then the second of black, and the third, our color's not very good here, of red ram skin, and then over that is this final exterior of the, uh, of the badger skins. Now, here's what I want you to see this morning. The first is linen, and even though on the, on the picture, go to the next slide, on the picture that you look at, it shows it as being blue, But the scripture said, and this is in Exodus chapter 26, and you'll have to listen close, but it'll be very understandable to you in a minute. Uh, The scripture says that it's made with blue and purple and scarlet on linen. The linen is white. The linen is taken from uh, whatever crop it's taken from, the flax plant. Actually, it'd be more of a creamy color than a white. But this speaks of the righteousness of God's saints. And I want you to look at this covering And it's going to look something like this. It's 28 cubits long. And the reason that uh, I want you to see this is because the tent of meeting is, remember, 10 cubits high, 10 cubits wide. So it's 10 plus 10 plus 10 equals 30. So I want you to say 30. But this one is is 10 sheets that are sewed together. The sheets are 28 cubits wide, and they're they're four cubits wide and 28 cubits long. So the first thing I want you to see, folks, uh, is when we look about this white righteousness of the saints, uh, that it's not quite 30 cubits. It comes just a little bit short on both sides. And this is very important for you to know because we have all what? Come short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. Even being redeemed, we still come short. Amen? We'll look at the number 30 in a minute, but right now I just want you to see that we all come what? Short uh, of the glory of God. This is white. It's made of linen. We'll remember in studying that linen came from Egypt. There was no flax plants. There was no cotton growing out in the wilderness. That makes sense, right? So whatever this was created of is stuff that people had brought with them when they left Egypt. Amen? All of us have brought some stuff with us when we came out of Egypt. (laughs) Any of you brought any stuff with you when you came out of Egypt? 
Well, think about it, folks. And God has to do what? He has to turn that stuff into righteousness. So what happens? First of all, the linen, the flax plant has to be cut off. You have to be cut off from where you came from. Amen. You have to throw the past off. Then it's what? It's ground. Amen. And it's wet down and it's twisted after it's dried and started to be twined together. I don't know a whole lot about quilting, but I, I, I think I can figure this out. That when you start to get the threads twisted together, and listen folks, you, even though you came out of Egypt, you have to get connected to God. You have to get threaded together with Him. Amen? He, he said a husband and wife, that's great, but a threefold cord cannot quickly be broken. Amen. We as a church, we as a body, amen, even though we came out of the Egypt of sin, we have to do what? We have to get twined together, fine twined linen. Amen. Then what happened? They soak that. Amen. All of us need a baptism, not only in water. We need to dwell in this presence of the Lord. After it's soaked, then the new fabric is stretched. Everybody say, stretch me, Lord. But then what happens? It shrinks. And just like I said this morning, there's some things of you that have to be thrown off. And you'll find yourself starting to feel like I'm shrinking. And then he stretches you. Then he shrinks you. And he stretches you. Come on, folks. And then he twines you together with other believers. And then you find yourself, amen, on the, on the, uh, or in, in the sewing room, literally. And God's weaving you into relationships with all kinds of people. Debbie, I'm so glad. Amen. I was thinking back the other day, the first time you prophesied over me at the Legend Theater, I thought I, I, I didn't even know who she was. And, and, but since that time, God has started to, amen, weave things together. Hallelujah. And you can go through all of the relationships in this house uh, that this is not an accident. Amen. If you had not been connected with people in this uh, surrounding, amen, you, 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 and it's not just yes, church. How many of you thank God for all of the intertwining that you've had with every pastor and preacher and every church member and every believer under where what? All of a sudden you start to make this big remnant, this big remnant. Now watch this, folks. There's going to be 10 of these different sheets. Why 10? Because one's going to be draped here and then the next one and then the next one and the next one until where there are five that fit in the inner court and then you take five more and you pull them up from the backside of the Holy of Holies and then you twine them together right above the veil. This is interesting, folks, because this is speaking about the law of God. White is what? The righteousness of the saints. White is what? Sinlessness. Perfection in God. So that, listen, and, and, and what are we looking at from under here? I see nothing but white. Psalm 51 and verse 6, he said he desires truth in the inward man. From the inside of who you are, they ought to, the, you should only see what? White. Too many of us see our own flaws. We see our own rejections. We see our own problems. Amen. But from the inside of your heart, looking up to God, you should see yourself as righteous. He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So I want you right now to clear all the clutter out of your thinking and look from where you are into your life and start seeing yourself cleansed. Amen? These linen sheets are bleached. I was in Haiti one time and I was over by a river bank and the water in the river was dirty, but they were getting water out and these ladies were working with some kind of solution that they had that when they pulled their garments out, it was whiter than any white I've ever seen in the United States. Amen. How do you know that Jesus can take the dirt of this world, but when he applies his saving blood, you come out whiter than snow, righteous. Help me get this going, Lord. There's 10 of these curtains that sew together to make the whole. Five plus five. What is that? That's the law of God. Five commandments that are heavenward. Five commandments that are earthward. The first five, what were they? Help me out. You shall have no other gods before me. Huh? You shall not make unto you any graven image. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You shall honor, you shall keep the Sabbath to Keep the holy. You shall honor your father and mother. There's five. They're all sewn together. There's 50 little eyelets that hook together with gold. Amen. And these five string together. And then they, they clasp to five others. 
Oh, I should make this a whole lot easier. What are the other five? You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet that which is your neighbor's. So five are heavenward. Five are earthward. But watch this, folks. He takes the five here and the five there, and he pulls them together, and with a thread of blue, runs it through the different eyelets and attaches it to the bottom, hallelujah, so that five and five make ten. And listen, the law of God is what? It's vertical because of our relationship with God, but it is horizontal because of our relationship with each other. And you cannot love God whom you have not seen if you don't love your brother whom you have seen. And on these two hang all the law and prophets. Amen? You say, so then, if we're under here, we're under the law. Not at all. The law is above us. The law is so high and so beautiful. The law is honorable. The law has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Amen. We can't keep the law because we come short of the glory of God. But how many know, Jesus, our righteousness, Jesus, our lamb, has done what? He's made the law of God fulfilled. Amen. And we aspire to that law. It's going nowhere. You, maybe you guys out there are getting this. Amen. I'm not saying you've got to keep the law. I'm saying when you get saved and the righteousness of Christ is applied to you, what happens? You begin to love the law of God. You live the law of God. You want to fulfill the law of God. Amen. In these, uh, even though it shows blue up there, it should be white because of the linen. But sewn across the bottom and in all of the different little eyelets is blue ribbon. Which means what? If you walked in and you looked at that, you would see blue. Amen. Crisscrossed above you and blue at the fringes. It's exactly like the woman that reached out and touched the little blue fringe. This tells me that heaven has come down and kissed earth. This tells me that healing has come. Amen. As you walk through the inner court, you see the blue of God's healing power. Another thing, there are cherubims or angels that are embroidered into all of this. You'll see them on the side there embroidered in wings. But it's also embroidered so that when you look from the inside up, you see all of these angels. Oh, hallelujah. What I'm trying to say, folks, people on the outside don't know what we experience on the inside. Amen. There are angels all above us. Help me preach this, Lord. You can't see it right now. You don't even see what I'm seeing. Amen. I'm looking up at... I'm looking up and seeing us righteous in Christ. And I'm looking up seeing the blue fringe of His healing. And I'm looking up and seeing that the angels of God are embroidered all around us. Come on. Can you get that vision with me? Come on, folks. Jesus said there are more than 12 legions of angels that will come to me right now. The psalmist said the angel of the Lord encamps round about them that fear Him. Hebrew says, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them that are heirs of salvation? The psalmist said the chariot of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. Come on, I want you to look up for 1 Peter 1 and verse 12 says that this gospel that's preached, the angels look down upon it, hallelujah, desiring to see the things that we are experiencing. Luke 15 and 10 says when one sinner repents, the angels of God rejoice. I want you to look up and see today that we are covered, that this house is filled. Amen. That when we walk in here on Thursday nights, it has never let us down one time. I'm not saying this just because I'm making something up. We study the Word, then we come in here to pray. And the moment you step about one stride past that wall, the presence of the Lord makes you start sometimes even weeping in this place. Oh, hallelujah. Why? It's not just the presence of God. There are angels positioned here. Amen. To guard you, to protect you. This is our safe place. This is our happy place. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. We we'll move on to the second thing. Next, and that's the black goat's hair. But I want you to see about the black goat's hair that it is 30 cubits long. This is interesting that in our righteousness we come short of the glory of God. But when it comes to the work of Jesus who took our place, notice that falls right exactly at 30 cubits. And the reason it's exact is because the sacrifice of Jesus fits exactly to our need. Come on, folks. I don't care what your sin is. Jesus is a fitting sacrifice. 
He is a perfect sacrifice. Amen. This is not our sin here. This is Christ's righteousness. Amen. This is Christ's substitution. He became sin for us. Look at this, folks. He took on our blackness. He took on our darkness. When I talk about black and white, please never think of a racial thing. Get that out of your head. Amen. All of us, no matter what color we are, that's skin pigmentation. That's nothing. Come on. You may be pink or you may be, have a little, green, little jaundice to you. I don't know. Get that out of your mind. White speaks of what? The righteousness of Christ. And this blackness here speaks of what? It speaks of the darkness of judgment. It speaks of the blackness of hell. It speaks of the darkness of our sin. See, there is no light in black. White is all seven colors together. White is light. But black is what? Black is without light. So what the picture here is what? Is that our sin is darkness. Our sin is judged. Amen. But what happened? Jesus is the one that took it for us. He became the scapegoat. Amen. He became the one that took our judgment. One lamb's blood was shed and brought to the mercy seat, but the other lamb was taken into an uninhabitable place and thrown over the, over the cliff. Amen. It's a picture that Jesus took our sins to hell with him. Amen. He took our blackness. He took our death. Death is symbolized in black. Jesus took our death. Am I right? Huh? And he did what? He took it perfectly. He ransoms us perfectly. Hallelujah. Now, there's something interesting about this. The front end is left hanging down. Do you see that? There's a reason for that because there are 11 4 by 30 cubit sheets in this set of curtains. The other was 10. This one has 11. So it dangles down in the front. Why 11? Because 11 is an interesting number. 10 is the law of God. 11 goes beyond the law of God. See, that's apostasy. 11 comes short of 12. 11's a number that's just kind of a misfit number. It's a picture of the Antichrist. You say, how is that? 10 is 10 disciples, or that 12 disciples, one of them backslid, Judas, that left them with 11. It's 11 days journey, amen, to the promised land, but they took 40, day, 40 years out of it. Amen. There were 10 horns, and the 11th, the little horn, is the Antichrist. Now, I don't want you to expect you to understand all of this, but if you can just see that Jesus is what? He has took our death. He has borne our judgment. Everything that was anti or against Christ, Jesus in his own body bore it on the cross. The sky became blackness of darkness above his head for three hours on one Friday afternoon. And he became what at that point? All of the sin of the human race was dumped upon Jesus. But notice this. He became sin for us that knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. What? In Him. Thank you, Jesus, for taking my penalty. Now you say, Chris, it's dangling over the front so that you see it when you walk in. Yeah, well, He doesn't bring our sins up to us. But it's dangling there to let us remember where He brought us from. How many of you thank God at times, sometimes I have to look back and remember the rock from whence I've been dug and remember the hell from which I've been saved. But notice this, we're coming from east to west, through the gate, past the brazen altar, past the labor, and there is that black uh, sheet hanging above us. Amen. And it reminds me, but when I go through into the inner court, guess what? All I see is white. All I see is purple and scarlet and blue and cherubim angels. And when you accept Jesus Christ, you're in a new place with him. You're a new creature. Come on, folks. Your judgment's in the outer court. I think a child can understand this if you'll flow with me for just a second. Hallelujah. And so Jesus, now, now here there are six of these sheets, and they're going to be coupled with five. The reason this laps over the front is because six and five would lap it over the front. But the six and the five are tethered together through 50 eyelets that are made of brass. Why not gold? Because brass is judgment. And there is no glory, there is no gold when you look at the darkness of our sin. Amen? And when you look at Jesus as our Calvary sin bearer, there's no beauty that we should desire him. 
There's nothing gold there. It's just the brass of the spikes that nailed him to the cross. Now watch this, folks. Six sets of sheets coupled with five sets of sheep, sheets. And the six means what? Six is sin. Six is man's number. Man works six days. The seventh is the Sabbath of rest. Six water pots with just a few firkins apiece. Six is the number of man. Six, six, six is the number of, of Antichrist man. So there are six sets of sheets. That's here that covers the front. And then there are five sets of sheets that cover the Holy of Holies. And they are coupled together right above the veil. Now this is important. Why the veil? The veil is where Jesus died for us. The veil was rent in two. It's a picture of Jesus dying to make access for us into the Holy of Holies. So six is what man? Five is what? Help me. What have we learned? Five is what? Grace. Grace. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Five wise virgins that accepted grace. Come on. God so loved the world, comma, that he gave his only begotten son, comma, that whosoever believeth on him, comma, shall not perish, comma, but shall have everlasting life. Amen. Five loaves of bread that were broke to feed the five. Five is the number of God's grace. Follow with me. We're going to take six sheets, couple them together, and it's going to carry to here. And then five sheets and couple them together and put them together here. It means what? Our sin and God's grace met where? At the veil. I said, man's sin and God's grace met at the veil. God is in the Holy of Holies reaching out to us. That's grace. We're moving into the inner court. Six, man, fallen. But we get connected with Jesus at the cross. And what happens? The sin bearer completely covers our past. He covers our sin. I feel like just, I feel like just draped, I feel like throwing Elvis scarfs out this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. I feel like, oh, yeah. Come on. Ooh. Righteous, sister. Righteous. Don't you let anybody taunt you, intimidate you ever again. Now, she doesn't have a problem with that. But why? Because she understands, hallelujah, that she's clothed in Christ. Hallelujah. She's made righteous. Oh, hallelujah. But I want you to also know, dear, hallelujah, that, uh, that it's for one reason. Because he took your penalty. And he took your sin. And today, I may get too hot for you there. Hallelujah. But amen. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. And it all converged where? Right exactly above the veil. He said, he said having boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Christ, by a new and living way, which he has perfected through the veil of his flesh. He's the veil. He's the way, outer court. He's the truth, inner court. He is the, he, he's the, I am the way, the truth. He is the life, holy of holies. Amen. Now I'm going to share something else today. And that is this third thing. And white is what? That's the gospel of Matthew. And black, that's what? That's the gospel of Mark. And let's go to the gospel of Luke. Where the clearest understanding of the work of God the cross was visited there in Luke. And notice this, folks. This one, it says, hallelujah. If I can get this down right. It does what? It completely covers everything in it. Come on, saints. That means what? Hallelujah. The blood. This is the blood. I said this is the blood. I said, this is the blood when the Father looks down from above. He doesn't see, hallelujah, your shame. He doesn't see your darkness. He doesn't see the blackness of your life. He sees what? He sees the red crimson blood of His Son. These are called ram skins dyed red. The dyeing process was very important. That, uh, that, 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 that scarlet worm that was crushed, where in Psalm 22, Jesus said, I am a worm and I'm no man. And on the cross, Jesus was crushed. And blood from his 
Well, first of all, from his capillaries as he bled in the Garden of Gethsemane, and then from his face as they pulled beard from his face, and then from his head as a crown of thorns caused blood to pour down his scalp, and then from his hands and from his feet, and then then the lance under his side. Everything is flowing with blood to where when they put his red robe back on his back after his lashing and scourging, it soaked it in blood. I believe when the priests took the ram skins, that's hides off of rams. Notice it wasn't a -A E-W-E-A-U because it's not the woman that dies, it's the man. Why? Adam's sin requires a man to die in the stead of Adam. Jesus is the ram. The ram is the head of the flock. Jesus, God didn't use something second best. He took his ram. He took the head, the strength of his house. Amen. And let Jesus, the ram. You know, the rams, they would cut the horns off. And then they would bleach the horns. They would clean the clutter out of the horns. And it was from the horns of the rams that the priests walked around Jericho and sounded the shofar blast. Because this red sacrifice, it symbolizes the strength of God. It's the ram. It symbolizes the praise of God because this is the ram's horn. This symbolizes a complete covering of our sin. How many of you are glad you're covered? Do you have insurance? Are you covered? Well, you say, I can't afford human insurance. Yeah, but are you under the blood? There's no weapon formed against you that can prosper. Amen. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. It's one thing, hallelujah, to be reminded of my past, but thank God, the blood, the blood in whom we have redemption through His blood. And if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. I don't know if you're getting this yet. Come on, folks. I look up and I see righteousness. I look up and I see cherubim. I look up and I see the activity of God. I am not able to understand or see because the mystery is beyond my intellect. But there is a covering of His substitutionary, amen, sacrifice. He became blackened with my sin. But He did something else. Amen. The ram, the head of the herd, the head of the flock, gave himself as a substitution, amen, for my sins. And he is what? He has covered me. Now notice this, folks. It does not say how big this ram skin. And obviously one ram couldn't cover this, right? This means a whole bunch of hides. In the garden it was skins for sins. Say that. Skins for sins. And that Propitiation has never been changed. It took blood on the doorposts. Amen. It took blood at the mercy seat. It took the blood of a sparrow to sprinkle the leper. Amen. It took seven sprinklings before the mercy seat to make access for the priest. So what are you saying here, Chris? This is essential covering. You say, you say, why? Why would God send somebody to hell? God never sent anybody to hell. Amen. Your black sin just left exposed and unatoned for except the sacrifice. Amen. It's sufficient. How big is it? Is it 30 cubits? Is it 40 cubits? Is it 20? Is it in strips of of 4 by 28? How big is it? Here's the beautiful thing, folks. Exodus 26 that gives us this picture does not tell us how big this red covering is. Remember something. The labor, how big was it? It didn't tell us. Why? Because no matter how much grace you need, amen, there's enough. He didn't tell us because some things are beyond measure. He reaches to the highest mountain. It flows to the lowest valley. The blood that gives me strength from day to day, it'll never lose its power. How high, how deep, the length, the breadth, the depth, the height of the love of Christ, which what? Passes knowledge. I could never give you a measurement. A human tape measure could never measure His love that is limitless, His grace that is great, His sacrifice that is sufficient, His energy that is enough. 
Come on, folks. How big, how wide his vast domain, how much of God, how much covering is there? It says there in Exodus that it said, and over it, ram skins dyed red, which means what? Everything that the black is, the ram skin perfectly seals it and covers it. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, we're left with a memory, but that's all it is. Under the blood protected, under the blood perfected, under the blood of Jesus, washed, justified, sanctified. Look at the black. Such were some of you, but now you're washed. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody the other day said, how come churches don't preach about Jesus anymore? There he is. I said, there he is. Hallelujah. Amen. And he's covered you. Amen. And he's seen you as righteous. And he's seen you. Hallelujah. He said, how come you're always picking on, on Amanda? Because I want Amanda to know that she is covered, hallelujah, with the righteousness of God. Amen. I want, I, want, I, want, I want Joe to know, hallelujah, that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. Amen. I want everybody to know this morning, hallelujah, that, that if I look back and I see where I came from, it's only a testimony to tell other people that this is what I was, hallelujah, but now I've been covered by the blood. I don't care if murder's in your past. I don't care what's in your past. It's covered. The Father only sees the Son. Hallelujah. Amen. This is Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Ram skins, plural, means what? All kinds of different facets of Christ's grace. You see him in one place here, and you see him in another, and he's taken on a whole new picture. And here he's the bread of life, and here he's the true vine. Over here he's the resurrection of life. And all of a sudden he shows up as the light of the world. And over here he's the rose of Sharon. Here he's the lily of the valley. And I, I see different strips of him. He's wonderful, and he's counsel, and he's everlasting father. I start to realize that all of these different hides are sewn together to make a fabric, amen, that covers me. Anybody getting anything out of this? There's a lot of times I've taught the tabernacle and just went through the furnishings. I didn't take time out for these things because these are deeper and they're harder to understand. But the fourth, and we, let, we, have, we have Matthew and we have Mark and we have Luke. Luke the, shows us the Son of Man. The way he was bleeding is even when he prayed, his sweat was like great drops of blood falling to the earth. And it was there that he was whipped and tortured and tormented. He was wounded for our transgressions. And this red, amen, and well, the black, of course, has the holes that loops the eyelets through as does the white. And what? He was pierced. He was punctured. He was perforated. Oh, hallelujah. And hooks held the tabernacle proper in place. Another place says nails. And so Jesus was nailed. I said Jesus was nailed. Hallelujah. So we could be a, his church. We could be his habitation. We can become the house that houses the glory. Wave your hand and say, I want that from my house. The last covering says very little about it. In fact, very little about this, just ram skins dyed red over it. But the last, it says, and this fourth one, and you'll see over there that they've got it kind of a brown color like cowhide. The King James Version says badger skins. Now, what I want you to see in this, because this is powerful to me, over that, a covering of badger skins. Uh, every translation you read is going to say something different. Some say leather. Well, the reason for this exterior covering is what? It's got to be able to handle hailstones. It has to protect from rain pouring. It has to be able to stand up to the pressure of desert wind like a sandstorm or like being sandblasted, this exterior surface 
has to cover you on the inside. Oh, can you get with me? Come on. I don't know how many of you have taken a sandblasting. I don't know how many of you have taken, amen, the wind of the howling storm to smack you. I don't know how many of you have been through the rain, you've been through the blizzard, you've been through the taunting, you've been through the haunting. Amen. The pebbles have flung your way. Amen. But it hasn't harmed you. It hasn't injured you. It hasn't drawn you away from the Lord one bit. Amen. Inside safe and secure from all alarm, leaning on the everlasting arms. I'm under, I'm not just, I'm under two curtains, of, amen, white and black, but I'm under two, I'm under two coverings. And didn't Paul say that, uh, that my life is hid with Christ in God? So this exterior, that's God himself. Come on, folks. That's Jesus. God in flesh covers me. <clears throat> and he covers me wholly. Amen. In fact, you can't see anything that's going on in there. If I'm out here on the other side, look at this. If I'm out here on the outside of the fence, somebody that doesn't know God, somebody who's never went in to taste and see that the Lord is good, what do you see from out here? You say, Chris, that's just a, a dingy, boring gray. Well, here's what Isaiah said. When we behold him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. Did you hear that? When you look at him from just the surface, what's so big deal about Jesus? He's just a common carpenter. When we behold him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. To the natural eye, the things of God are foolishness. Do you all see that? Just no gray exterior. What do you guys get all so up about? Well, you have to come in. <laughs> you have to come to the brazen elder. You have to come to the labor. Then you have to duck yourself and come under and then look up. And you start to see his righteousness and you start to see the sin bearer and you start to see redemption in its fullness. Oh, hallelujah. From the inside, it's a whole lot different beauty than what the world sees. The world doesn't understand you, never will understand you. That's why Jesus is cheap to the world. Look at it. But to you and I that are on the inside, hallelujah. The fact that he became just a man like you and I is what covers me from the assault of the storm. Let the storm crack. Let the lightning thunder howl at me. I'm in Christ. Everybody say, in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Hallelujah. Now, I said there's a lot of translations. Some say leather. Some say porpoise hide. And this makes the most sense to me. Because porpoise would be something they could have harvested <clears throat> at different seasons around the Red Sea and so forth or whatever. But if it's porpoise hides and the priest had to go to the Red Sea to, to retrieve this, that means that you had to go real deep to get this. I said you had to go real deep to get this. What I'm talking about today, folks, is not a surface relationship. This is a deep thing. Porpoise hide would do what? It would shed rain. It would shed storms. It would be as tough as cow hide. And, but King James says badger's skins. What do you mean badger's? <clears throat> well, it could have been rock badger's out there. It wouldn't be badger's like we have in the Midwest. But here's what I want you to see. In Ezekiel chapter 16, I believe it's verse 10. Uh Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 10. You remember when he was, when he was uh, talking about how that he swaddled us and salted us? And it says, and I gave to you coverings, and it said, I put badger skins on your feet. I shod you with badger skin. Look at this, folks. Where did they get the badger skin that they made this covering from? I believe they gave the shoes off their feet for the tabernacle. I said, I believe they gave the shoes off their feet to build this tabernacle. I don't know what you want to invest. I don't know how much you care about what God's wanting to build here. I don't know how committed you are to it. 
But back then, they wanted the glory and the plan of God through Moses to be fulfilled so much that they took their sandals off and threw them in a pile and said, Bezalel, tear them apart, sew them together, and make this covering. Some people won't even give this much, and they gave the shoes off their feet. Come on, saints. But here's what happened. Whatever shoes they had left, you remember what it said? Forty years. They never stretched. They never wore out. You give God the shoes off your feet, and whatever shoes you got left will last you till Jesus comes again. Somebody say, praise the Lord. I believe that. So here's what I want you to see. Here's the question as I, uh, I probably better close now because of the ladies thing. I was going to go on to the veil, but here's where I close. Is it leather? Is it cowhide? Is it porpoise? Is it badger? Is it rock badger? Everybody say, what is it? Tell us, Chris. I can't tell you. You know, there's some things as much as I've studied God's Word, there's a whole bunch of stuff I still don't know. There's some things that are mysteries. There's some things that are beyond us. And when I look at this exterior and I sit down here scratching my head, saying, what is it? What what is it, God? Your ways are unsearchable. Your things are past finding out. God, in my best logic, I try to put together who you are. And that was that way with the minds of the Grecians who had a tomb or an altar to an unknown God. God is unknowable, and yet we know Him. He is beyond searching, and yet I've found Him. Hallelujah. He is a mystery that could never be explained or accounted for. And yet, in our simplicity, I know that I know that I know Him. So this last outer covering, what? The Gospel of John. Somebody says, start with John. No, don't start with John. It's too deep. Somebody says, I got John all figured out. Do you have John figured out? Sorry, folks, I don't. I've been serving Christ for 45 years, and I haven't got that book figured out yet. Because every time I read it, I sit here and I look at the mystery of an unknowable God who's beyond anything I could ever search out. Oh, hallelujah. I think I've got Matthew down pretty well. I think I've got Luke. I wrote commentaries on both. Haven't stepped out to write on John yet. Why? Ten cubits high. It's above my head. A mystery color that I can't even figure out. And I don't even know if it's porpoise or if it's cowhide. Would everybody right now say, I don't know everything about you, God, but I sure would like to get to know you better. I would sure like to understand who you are. Oh, hallelujah. And, and could, I, could I tell somebody today, hallelujah, that even though he's past finding out, oh, hallelujah, and he goes beyond, hallelujah, anything that we could even understand. And I don't understand his ways, and I don't understand the whys and the, all of it, hallelujah, but I'm underneath it. Hallelujah. And I've placed myself under And that's what faith is, is just coming under his grace. Oh, hallelujah. I want to hear him praising people, praising God all over this house. Will you do that for a minute all over this house? Oh, hallelujah. 